This is Dr. Momsilovich's Lecture 6.1 on Basal Plants. For the next couple of lectures, we're going to be talking about different types of plants. All land plants come from the eukaryotic supergroup Archaeplastidia. They're a monophyletic group, meaning that they only have evolved a single time and come from a basal lineage of plants that originally colonized the land. There are many, many different types of plants and we can't possibly do justice to all of those different types of plants in this class. So we're going to instead break them down into a few large groups and talk about characteristic species or characteristic types for each of these different groups. Today's lecture is going to cover the non-vascular seedless plants, which are the bryophytes. And in particular, we're going to discuss the, the life cycle of mosses from that group. And we're also going to talk about seedless vascular plants, which are broken down into lycophytes, which include things like club mosses, and pterophytes, which include things like ferns. And for that group in particular, we're going to discuss ferns. So if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you can see a phylogeny for different types of plants. So chlorophytes and pterophytes are the sister groups to the basal land plants. The first type of plants to colonize the terrestrial environments were the mosses, followed by the lycophytes, and then moving on to the monocots and dicots, um, and from there, um, seed plants, which are gymnosperm, uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms, which we'll discuss in the next lecture. So like I said before, all land plants are monophyletic meaning that they come from a common ancestor that colonized a terrestrial environment. And from what we can estimate, plants first appeared on land between 400 and 500 million years ago. It's kind of crazy to think about the fact that plants have only been living on land for about 400 million years. If you think back a few lectures, we had very, very diverse types of fish living in our oceans about 400 million years ago. So about the same time that fish were becoming very diversified is the time that land plants first came onto land. There were several adaptations that plants needed to be able to colonize the terrestrial environment. First, they needed to be able to transport water and nutrients to their leaves because when you're submerged in water, you can do that through the process of osmosis or diffusion. So in order for plants to live on land, they needed to develop a system that would allow them to get water and nutrients to parts of the plant that were not in direct contact with the water. In addition, water is very important um, for dispersing gametes and propagules when plants live in the water or near the water. For plants to live completely on dry land, plants had to come up with new mechanisms to disperse their gametes and their propagules. All land plants have a life cycle that includes an alternation of generations. What that means is that for part of the plant's life, it is a multicellular diploid organism and for another part of its life, it's a multicellular haploid individual. The amount of time that each plant spends as either a diploid or a haploid depends on the type of plant. So when we're talking about something being either diploid or haploid, when, when it's in terms of a plant, a diploid, meaning that it has two copies of the genome, is known as a sporophyte, meaning that phyte means a plant and sporo means a type of plant that releases spores. 
or when it's multicellular and haploid, meaning that it has one copy of the genome, it's a gametophyte, meaning a plant that makes gametes. So if you look at the figure in the middle of your screen, if you look towards the right-hand side, we're going to start with the fusion of gametes. So we're going to start with the fusion of a sperm and an egg to create a zygote. That zygote undergoes the process of mitosis to create a sporophyte. A sporophyte will then release spores that have been created through the process of meiosis. Those spores, once they land, will go through the process of mitosis to create a gametophyte. The gametophyte will then create gametes and the process continues. So that during part of the plant's life cycle, you have a haploid gametophyte stage and for the other part, a diploid sporophyte stage. The non-vascular plants that are alive today are thought to be very similar to the first land plants. They grow in moist environments in dense mats that are generally not more than probably five to seven centimeters in height. They stay very low to the ground. They're very small and they don't have a system that allows them to conduct water from the soil to their plant body parts. They rely on the moist environment to get water and nutrients into their tissues as well as get their gametes and their spores dispersed. Examples of plants that fall into this category are things like mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. In bryophytes, which are things like mosses, the way that they reproduce is through their haploid gametophyte, which produces gametes and specialized sex organs via the process of meiosis. So within a single bryophyte, there are both male and female structures. Part of the plant will create sperm and the other part will produce an egg. In this type of plant, the male part is called the antheridium and it produces many sperm with two flagella on each sperm. This type of plant also has a structure that's the female part that's called an archegonium, which produces one egg. So for the purpose of this, we will consider the part of the plant that creates the mobile gamete to be the male or to create the sperm and the, the part of the plant that creates the stationary gamete or the egg to be the female. And so the male antheridium will produce sperm and then release them and they will use the moist environment to swim towards the egg cell. Generally, we think through. After the sperm fertilizes the egg, that embryo will develop into a sporophyte, which is then capable of producing spores. The sporophyte is a diploid structure that grows out of the gametophyte. The sporophyte produces spores in part of it that's called a capsule through mitosis. Those spores are then released and settle away from the original gametophyte and begin to create a new gametophyte. The first part of a new bryophyte plant to start developing is called a protonema. And from that, the rest of the new plant begins to develop. So to put all of this together, bryophytes or mosses go through this process of alternation of generations. This starts when you have a sperm fertilize the egg in the gametophyte. That is now a diploid embryo. That embryo then grows a sporophyte, which is diploid, from the haploid gametophyte. Within that sporophyte, there's a structure called a sporangium, which creates spores. The spores are created through mitosis, and after that process, they are 
haploid. So the spores are haploid, which then travel through water to get to a new location and create male and female gametophytes. So we talked about the fact that sometimes those gametophytes are on the same plant and sometimes they are separate plants. So they're either monoecious or dioecious, depending on the species. Then the male gametophyte will produce sperm and that sperm will travel through water to find a female gametophyte to fertilize the egg and the process continues again. The next group of plants we're going to discuss are called the vascular plants. So bryophytes were small and lived close to the ground because they didn't have any vascular tissue to conduct water and nutrients from the soil and their roots up to their leaf structures. Vascular plants evolved a system to conduct water and nutrients from the roots up to their leaves. We're not going to go into huge detail on how that evolved. Um, if you're interested, I, am, I would suggest taking a botany course at some point in your college career, but it's a little bit too much to talk about for our purposes. So we're just going to say that in vascular plants, vascular tissue evolved and it was a big breakthrough in plants being able to colonize land. So the vascular system in plants consists of tissue that's going to transport, like we said, water and minerals up to the leaf structures. So if you were to cut a leaf in half and then look at the layers of the leaf, on the outside or the top of the leaf, you would see a cuticle followed by an upper epidermis, followed by the palisade mesophyll, which is where most of photosynthesis takes place. Below that is a spongy mesophyll, followed by a lower epidermis. And within that lower epidermis, on the bottom side of the leaf, you would have small openings called stoma, which is where the exchange of CO2 and oxygen takes place. So if you think back to Bio 182, you need CO2, water, and sunlight for the process of photosynthesis. And from that, you make glucose and oxygen. And it's through the stoma that the plant takes in CO2 and releases oxygen. Also within this um, cross-section of the plant is what we call the vascular bundle. And in the vascular bundle, there are two types of structures. One is called xylem and one is called phloem. And what they do is conduct water and minerals either up to the plant or down into the rest of the plant, depending on which direction they go. So xylem conducts water and minerals from the soil up to the aerial parts of a plant. Um, and some cells also have lignin, which helps provide some support for those structures. Phloem, on the other hand, conducts products of photosynthesis, sugars, down through the rest of the plant. So xylem is vascular tissue that pulls water and minerals from the soil up to the leaves, and phloem takes the products of photosynthesis and disperses it to the other structures in the plant. Depending on the type of plant that we're looking at, the vascular bundles are arranged differently. So in dicot plants, you have a lot of ground tissue that is sort of an open part in the middle of the plant um, in the vascular bundle with xylem and phloem arranged in a ring around the outside where we generally have phloem towards the outside and xylem towards the inside. On the other hand, in monocot plants in the stems, you have the vascular bundles sort of arranged um, all over the inside of that stem. 
One of the big differences between seedless vascular plants, which are things like ferns, and the bryophytes, or the non-vascular plants that we discussed, are that in seedless vascular plants, the large sporophyte is independent of the small short-lived gametophyte. So in the bryophytes, the sporophyte was dependent and neutrally dependent upon the small gametophyte. In seedless vascular plants, the sporophyte is an independent structure of the gametophyte. Within the seedless vascular plants, there are two types. The first are called lycophytes, and the second are called pteraphytes. We're going to talk more in detail about the pteraphytes, which are the ferns. In ferns, the dominant generation is the sporophyte. So the diploid sporophyte produces spores in a sporangium through the process of mitosis. On the bottom of a fern leaf, if you turn it over, you can see small circles that are actually called sorus. And within the sorus, that is where the sporangium are located and they create the spores that are part of the ferns alternation of generations. Ferns have a haploid gametophyte that produces gametes in specialized sex organs. Those structures are located at the base of the fern plant. The female part, or the archegonium, has a heart shape and is quite a bit larger than the male part, which is the antheridium. The antheridium produces many sperm, which travel again through water to reach the archegonium where the egg is, and that is where fertilization takes place. If we look at the alternation of generations in vascular plants, starting with the process of fertilization, we see that the sperm cell from the antheridium fertilizes the egg cell that is located in the archegonium. From the archegonium, a sporophyte, which is diploid, grows out of that archegonium. The archegonium slowly dissolves as that sporophyte develops. When the fern is in the sporophyte phase, on the back of the leaves there are sporangium, which are diploid, and they create spores. The spores are haploid. The spores travel away from the parent plant and th create the gametophyte phase. And the gametophyte has the male antheridium and the female archegonium. And again, the process continues. The rest of the extant seed plants fall into two groups. The gymnosperms, which are things like pine trees, and the angiosperms, which are all of the other flowering plants. Most of the living plants on the planet at the moment are angiosperms. And the reason for that is that it was such an efficient way for plants to reproduce that gymnosperms radiated all over the planet. And so the next lecture, we're going to talk more about the seed plants, which are the gymnosperms and the angiosperms.